So today we want to do various kinds of migration reality. So since Tony's not here, I don't have to write big. Uh, so I defined, I started by defining last time, I defined the cap product. So this is a map from everything is going to be singular. So singular cochains, well, singular cochains into singular chains into singular chains. And the way the dimensions work is if, if a singular cochain of degree K and a singular chain of degree N you end up with a singular, this thing is of degree in minus k. And the definition that I gave you was, uh, what we call it, beta, beta cap, cap gamma, that's a chain so to know what chain it is, you just have to say how every cochain evaluates on it. And the formula is simply an adjoint of the coupling. Now you can unravel what this says, and it says that beta cup of simplex, let's say, is, um, though this is a sing one singular simplex, is as it goes. Beta evaluated on the back face of whatever the appropriate degree is times the front face. So if this were an N and this were a K, it would be the back N minus K face. That's an integer times the front K face. As you see from this formula, this formula evaluated on gamma gives alpha on the front k phase times beta on the back n minus k phase. So if you evaluate alpha on this expression, you get the same thing. Okay. And then we had variants of this cap product uh, when we had non-compact spaces, both the compact and non-compact spaces. We can go from the compactly supported singular cochain, tensor, the locally finite singular chain, and end up in the ordinary singular chain. supported and gamma is going to be locally finite. And the point is just that the same expression makes sense. So if I look, I try to take beta, one of, so I have, this is beta, and here I have summation of lambda sigma sigma, some probably infinite sum, but finite on every compact set. And I want to do the cap product. Well, I have to take the sum of the coefficients times beta on the back n minus k base of sigma times the front k base of sigma. And that's the formula. And the claim is that. If beta is compactly supported and this is a locally finite chain, this is a finite sum in the sense that, um, well. so the point is beta is compactly supported. So there's some compact set that is, is, contains a supported beta, and there are only finitely many of the sigma that meet that compact set. All the rest of the sigma are outside the compact set. So for any sigma outside the compact set, this is zero. So you're only worried about the finite number of sigma in this expression that meet the compact set. So then you get a finite answer. Okay. And it's clearly violating. 
There's also a variant, the ordinary singular cochains, tends to the locally finite chains into the locally finite chains. Again, now this is a locally finite expression, and this is an arbitrary cochain. So it may evaluate non-zero on an infinite number, maybe all of the sigma. And so the sum that you're getting is going to be an infinite expression. But if you restrict any compact set, only finitely many of the sigma meet that compact set, and thus only finitely many of these terms meet that compact set. So it's a locally finite expression. Okay, so now the segments of point graduality. So MN is an oriented N manifold. So that means that for every point in manifold, the homology of M and M minus X, well we know that's that isomorphic to Z. And the orientation gives us a generator. A distinguished generator. So you recall from last time, you have two, two generators here. So if you think of pairs consisting of a point in the manifold and, an, and a local orientation, that is a choice of a generator for this group at that point, you get a two-sheeted cover of the manifold. The manifold's orientable if that cover is trivial two-sheeted cover, and picking one of the two sheets, that is picking consistent orientations as you go around, is what you mean when you say the manifold is oriented. Okay, the first lemma is, There exists a unique class, usually denoted this way, brackets in, in the nth locally finite homology of the manifold with the property that the image of this class in the relative homology m, m minus the point is the distinguished generator.
And if you have two of them, you have a locally finite thing here, a locally finite thing here, you have to prove by neatness that they agree on the overlap, and then you can piece them together and just keep them on. Anyway, that's the fundamental class. And the statement of Franklin duality in this context is that cap product with this fundamental class, well, there's two versions of cap product, this one and this one. And I forgot to say, both of these are uh, maps of chain complexes and pass to the cohomological level. So you have compactly supported cohomology, tensor locally finite homology. The cap product gives you an ordinary homology class or a ordinary cohomology class, a locally finite class gives you a locally finite class. So we have cap product with the fundamental class, maps HK with compact support of the manifold into HN minus K of the manifold. This is an N manifold. And the other variant of it is you can go from HK of the manifold into HN minus K will be fine of the manifold. And Clarkery duality is a statement. these maps are, right? these cat products are basically one Once again, I mean it's, all you have is the local structure of the manifold, that you have these coordinate charts. So once again, this is going to be an inductive argument putting together coordinate charts. As you go, it's slightly more complicated than the existence of the fundamental class. Now, the form of it that you usually see is when the manifold is compact, where if M is compact, then there's no distinction between these compactly supported cohomologies, ordinary cohomology, and locally finite homologies is, is ordinary homology. Then there's a fundamental class which lies in the ordinary entomology of the manifold, and then with your coefficients, and capping with the fundamental class is an isomorphism in the case homology, which is the minus k homology. And if you remember way back to the beginning of this series of lectures, I more or less sketched for you in the case when M was smooth and had a handle decomposition how this isomorphism goes. You take the chain complex that comes from the handle decomposition and turn it over, basically, and that's what point of duality is. There's also a beautiful proof, beautiful geometric proof for uh, triangulated manifolds where you replace the triangulation with its dual triangulation. You know, if you have a, you have a triangulated surface like this, And then there's a dual triangulation. In the dual triangulation, every n simplex has a dual vertex, which is very center. Dual to, in this case, every one simplex. Another basic fact about compact manifolds 
is that their homology, cohomology, or finite degenerated. Again, if your manifold is smooth and you have a handle decomposition, it has only finite and many critical points, so you have a finite chain complex, finite degenerated chain complex. For a general topological manifold, again, it requires a slightly complicated inductive argument. So the homology of the M and the cohomology of the M are finitely generated. Now there are versions of micro-duality for non-orientable manifolds. The most straightforward version is to work with Z2 coefficients. That, that is true for topological manifolds. Yeah, yeah, that's the point. For a smooth manifold, it's sort of obvious from the handle decomposition. For topological manifold, it requires a little argument. Again, it's by induction on the, you know, covering by coordinate matches. Nothing quite obvious. I mean, none of these statements is really completely straightforward for topological manifolds. Maybe I'll actually write them out and put them in the notes. I mean, they're standard references where you can find them, but they're, they're nice arguments, but a little bit intricate. So, what about non orientable manifolds? That's not the only thing you can do. 
The other thing you can do is you can take, instead of using ordinary untwisted coefficients, you can take coefficients in, the local, in a local system, namely the orientation system, and the duality is between the homology with, with untwisted co coefficients and cohomology uh, in the twisted coefficients. So there's also twisted versions. sequences, short exact sequences to short exact sequences. So we have 0, A, B, C. That's our short exact sequence. Now we apply this functor to it. So we get what's contravariant, so the arrows get turned around. Exact says that in fact this is an injection, which is sort of obvious. If you have a homomorphism from C to anything, but we're doing Z, and if it's if the composition of B to C to this thing is zero, that's what it would mean to say it goes to zero over here, then in fact the, the homomorphism is already zero. But this is map is onto. So if this composition is zero, it says every element of B is zero, but every element in C is hit by something in B, so every element of C goes to zero. This functor is left exact, but it's not right exact. You can't put, in general, a zero here. It does not preserve short exact sequences. And maybe the simplest example is Consider the sequence Z multiplication by two to Z to make it Z minus two. Okay. Now we hom into Z. Hom of Z two to Z is zero. That's this one. Hom of Z to Z is Z. 
and how the z to z is z, but dual the multiplication by 2 is a multiplication by 2. You take the identity map from z to itself, this composition and multiplication by 2. Not on 2. Okay. It is exact. It's exact here, that is, this map is injective. It's exact here, the kernel of this map is the image of this map, but this one is not on. Okay. Well, thanks to Grothendieck and many other people way back in the 50s and 60s, one understood how to treat non-exact functors. In this case, what you do is you take z and you replace it with an injective resolution. sequence, well, not sure, you have an exact sequence. Turns out in this case, for abelian groups, the short exact sequence can be chosen to terminate after the zeroth and first stage. In general, in other categories, it's more complicated, and this injective resolution may go on forever. But here it's only two steps, and I'll show you one in just a second. And then you consider com of your elements into this thing. And that makes it complex. And you take its homology. And that's what you mean by R hom. So R hom is, a, is really a chain complex, or in, our, in this context, you can just replace the chain complex by its homology. So what is this injective resolution of z? Anybody want to tell me? Q of u mod z. Q of q mod z. So this is certainly a short exact sequence. We need to know that these two groups are injective in the category of abelian groups. Should I say what injective means? An injective is any time you have, uh, which way did it go? You have a map of B to I. Oh, oops. H. Right. Anytime you have a map of A to I, it can extend over B. Now, for abelian groups, the only question, the only, the group is injected if, if and only if every element is divisible to any order. Right, you sort of see that's obvious. If you take z included as in z, you have a map here. Well, that's just an element, the image of 1. And if you're going to be able to complete this diagram, that element better be divisible by n. Then you can complete the diagram. Well, so that's what you have to do for this group. If a and b were finally generated, it comes down to the exact same question. And any group any pair of groups like this is a limit of finite generated subgroups. And it suffices to do it for the finite generated subgroups. So injectivity for abelian groups is just divisibility. And Q and Q mod Z are divisible. Not unique divisibility, it's just divisibility. What about like Z mod 2? What's an injective resolution? What? What's an injective resolution? Z mod well, let's think. That's an injective resolution. Yeah, so you want to take 
So Z bracket a half. Well, I don't mean that. I mean so all all rational numbers with denominator a power of two. Then I guess I could multiply by two. Trouble is that's not. Short exact sequences. Well, so what happens then for R hom is you take hom of A and Q and the hom of A and the Q mod Z. This is just a coefficient map. You have a homomorphism to Q, you follow by the projection of Q mod Z. And the kernel is hom. Of A into Z, and the co kernel is R hom 1 of A into Z. This is, of course, R hom 1. So the first thing you need to see is that the kernel of this map is the homomorphisms from A into Z, but that's pretty clear. If you have a homomorphism of A to Q, and it vanishes when you go over here, that means when you compose with the projection from Q to Q mod Z, this composition of the map is zero, which means the image of the map is contained in Z. So you really have a homomorphism to Z. Conversely, if you have a homomorphism to Z, and you include it here, it's going to go to zero. And this thing, is the co kernel. So these two are the homology of this co chain complex. This is the different, the differential is just the coefficient map. The kernel is H0 and the co kernel is H1. In general, if you have a longer injective resolution, you get higher derived homs. This goes under the name of the classical name for this is X1A. Classical one this one is hot maybe. Now that's all very fancy, but if we think about at least finitely generated groups, it's very simple. So let's think about what happens when we want to take our hom of a finitely generated group. Well, this is going to be, our hum is going to be additive in this variable. So if A is a direct sum of pieces, then both our hum naught and one are going to be direct 
some of those. So we might as well, all we have to do, because of the classification of finally generated meaning groups, we just have to consider the cases A equals C and A equals C mod N. Every finally generated meaning group is a direct sum of pieces like this. Well, far palm, so palm, Z to Q to Q mod Z. So X1 of Z to Z is zero, because co kernel error is zero. Okay, now what about Z mod N? Well, that's the one I just did. Hom of Z mod N to Z is zero. Hom of Z mod N to Q is zero. And Hom of Z mod N to Q mod Z, then it's the co kernel. So this is X1 It's just the maps, the homomorphisms from Z mod N to the circle. Q mod Z is the set of elements of finite order in the circle, Z mod N is, is only has finite order elements. So this is Hom of Z mod N to the circle. It's the same thing. So from that we see that our Hom not of A into Z is just the dual lattice A mod torsion A. This is some lattice free of any group of finite rank, dualized. Hom of the lattice in the Z. And R hom one of A in the Z. Well, you get the homomorphisms from the torsion of A in the Q minus Z. So this is the dual group to the lattice, A mod torsion A, and this is the Pontryagin dual, as it's called, of this finite abelian group torsion A. So this is also palm torsion A into the circle, and that's called the Pontryagin dual. This is all assuming A final generation. More generally, things don't split up so nicely. Um, X1 can be non trivial even if there's no torsion in general. So here's an exercise for you. Compute. sense of uh, algebra. So you take, maybe I should say it this way. So I, I don't mean just 1 over p, I mean 1 over every power of p, which is what this gives you. That's the polynomial expressions in 1 over p. The x to that into z. Though this is torsion free, it's a subgroup of uh, the rationals, a nice torsion free group, but it's got an uncountable x. But we've got our compact manifolds, so they have finally generated homology, and we're going to be able to use this.
So now we're going to display our um, uh, the homology. I got to call homology <laughs> into Z as a double complex. So here I have the cohomological degree, and here I'll have the um, the uh, R hop degree, the injective resolution degree. And in this case, <coughs> <coughs> so here we'll have. Um, complex, but I'm just going to do it with the homology group. So I could actually put the chains here. Then you have the vertical arrows being given by the boundary group going down. The boundary maps and the co-chain. Well, actually, I do cohomology co-chains and I have the co-boundary maps, the differentials in the co-chains. Because Q and Q mod Z are injected, the vertical arrows just pass to, that's an E naught when you take the vertical differentials, which are D-naught, that just passes to cohomology. Because this sends, these are injective, so exact sequences go to exact sequences. So you end up at E1 with just the hom of the cohomology in that case, into Q and Q mod Z, and this map is D1. Let me just tell you 
how these maps work and what, what these maps are explicitly. So suppose I have a co-chain, a co-cycle. So alpha is an N co-cycle. So that represents an element in the N cohomology. So it'll have some image over here, a homomorphism from the entomology to Z. We ought to be able to figure out what that is. So alpha is supposed to give us a map from HN of X to Z. And you can probably tell me what it is. What does it do to a homology class? Just pick. And as we know, this pairing is well defined, if you vary alpha by a co-boundary, its value on zeta will be zero because zeta is a, itself is a, is a cycle. And if you vary this by a boundary, so that's this, this is just the evaluation here. This one's a little more interesting. So notice, this thing is a free abelian group. It's hom, finally generated free abelian group. It's hom of a finally generated abelian group to Z. That's the same as hom of a abelian group minus torsion to Z. The torsion has to go to zero. But this group minus torsion is a free abelian group. It's some lattice, and this is the dual lattice. So this is a free abelian group. And this is a torsion group. So this is the torsion subgroup in the cohomology. And the quotient of the cohomology minus torsion is the dual lattice. So H, so x1 of H n minus 1 of x z is the torsion subgroup of Hn of x z and the quotient is the dual lattice to the free abelian group Hn x z mod torsion. So, so this pairing, if alpha represents a torsion class, then it's going to go to zero here. So this pairing is, the evaluation pairing induces a pairing between Hn of x my torsion, insert Hn of x my torsion, which is z. And these makes each of these the dual lattice to the other. So this is a perfect pairing. Meaning that it's adjoint, which goes from here to hom of this into z, is an isomorphism. That's just what we have here. So that's a perfect pairing. And can we also compare the torsion of that? Yeah, so that's what we're going to do next. And similarly, we have torsion H in of X tensor torsion H in minus 1 of X into 2 minus Z is perfect. Makes each of these torsion groups the dual to the other. Now I emphasize I'm, I'm assuming I guess X doesn't look like a manifold, but I'm certainly assuming the homology is kind of generated here, or else none of this holds. So perfect again means the adjoint, which is then a map from this torsion group to hom of this torsion group to G mod Z, is an isomorphism, and if you reverse the roles, that will still be true. Okay. Yeah? Then we get that E1 page over here. What did that 
Um, this one? Yeah, this spectral sequence will be uh, Well, I, I could have started with the co-chains, or the, I could have, doing this way, I should start with the co-chains. Yeah. So I have a double complex, which is the co-chains, the singular co-chains, um, Yeah, so I have a double complex. Up here I have the singular co-chains with Q coefficients, and up here I have the singular co-chains with Q minus Z coefficients. The vertical differentials are just co-chain differentials, and the horizontal differentials are the coefficient map. So that makes a double complex. I'm filtering it this way. So E naught is simply the vertical differential. I'm sorry, D naught is the vertical differential. Because Q and Q mod Z are injective, it turns out you simply end up with the cohomology with Q coefficients here and the cohomology with Q mod Z coefficients here. And D1 is the horizontal map, which is map induced by coefficients. So that's where the special sequence comes from. And then what do we know that that converges to? Converges to the cohomology of the well, converges in this case to the homology of the. So if I did it with, as I was saying, with cohomology, so if I took cochains with coefficients in Q and cochains with coefficients in Q minus Z, that's my double complex, then uh, with this filtration, it converges to the homology in the negative dimension. And I want to 
try to figure out what that's supposed to be. Now, it doesn't have any, I mean, this isn't a very good notation because it's not going to be an evaluation. These things are in different degrees, so I can't pair in any obvious way alpha with uh, zeta. But there's two things you could do, and they turn out to give the same answer. What I know is there exists, so for some n, some k, zeta is zeta n minus 1 is the boundary of some beta n. Because it's a torsion homology class. So it's a cycle. It's probably not homologous to 0 because then it would be trivial. But it represents a torsion class, so some multiple of it is a boundary. So for some integer k, k zeta is the boundary of a beta. Okay? And now I can pair alpha with beta. And that's an integer. Well, that's not a very good answer because certainly that will depend on what k I choose. If I chose twice k, then I could take two beta, and this evaluation would be twice the answer. So the appropriate expression has got to be 1 over k alpha evaluated on beta. Now that's a rational number. And why is it independent of beta and k? But let's just think about beta for a second. So I could vary beta by the by any co-cycle. So, so let's take beta and replace it by beta plus a co-cycle mu. So this is a co-cycle. So I can only use a co-cycle if I want to get this equation satisfied. I can only vary it by co-cycle. And now alpha on beta plus mu, well, it's alpha on beta plus alpha on mu. Why is this going to vanish? Boundary. 
All right, so I can replace zeta by zeta plus boundary of nu. Right, this is an arbitrary chain. And now alpha on this will be alpha on zeta in one plus bound plus alpha on boundary alpha on nu. in terms of cochains and so on of what these well, cochains and chains what these pairings look like. Now I want to give you a geometric description of the way we think about these pairings. And then I want to draw some consequences. So, geometric
Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work with smooth manifolds here. So these, I can think of these cycles as actual geometric maps of simplices, finite combination of simplices in whose boundaries all match up to give me a cycle. And the fact that you can approximate maps by smooth maps allows me to assume that zeta and c are made up of smooth c infinity uh, simplices. And furthermore, I can assume each simplex here meets each simplex here transversally by a SAR theorem argument. Okay. Well, if you look at the co-dimension one, so if you look at the n minus one skeleton of this chain, it's too low a dimension to meet this chain because the sum of the dimensions is n minus one. So in fact, these chains meet transversally, that tells you, i.e. zeta k and c n minus k meet only in the interior of top degree synthesis. And the points of intersection, if this is zeta k and this is c n minus k, this might be the image. I'm imagining this is the image of a k simplex in sigma, and this is the image of an n minus k simplex uh, from c. And I get, in this case, a point of intersection. Now I can associate a sign to that point of intersection. So the sign of the intersection. Well, these are simplices, a k and an n minus k. So they're oriented. They have the orientation from the simplices. So these are both oriented. So the tangent planes come with orientations, this point of intersection. And I can then form on their direct sum an orientation, the sum of the orientation from the first piece, and then plus the sum of the orientation from the second. On the other hand, this is all taking place in an oriented n-manifold. So this tangent plane at this point of the whole n-manifold has the orientation from the manifold. So I can pair the sum of these two orientations with the orientation of the manifold. If they agree, I put plus one. If they disagree, I put minus one. So if you think about a Riemann surface or even the plane, like this and this, depending on, well, I say, one in this direction, and the plane has the usual orientation, one, two, so this is one, and this is two. This is a plus point of intersection. This is a minus point. This is a plus point. Okay, so then you just add up over the intersection points points of intersection, these signs. And you get an integer. And that's called the intersection of these two cycles. The algebraic intersection number cycles. Uh, 
algebraic because if you ask about the geometric intersection number, you would call it three. There are three points here, but algebraically, when you count them as nine, you get a one. And now the little limit is this algebraic intersection number. Depends only on the homology class classes of theta and C and is another version of this pairing between the uh, lattices. to have here is a pairing hk of x tensor h n minus k of x into z if what I, if the first part of this lemma once I establish the first part of the lemma that the algebraic intersection number only depends on the homology classes it's going to give a pairing like this it's clearly bottling here once Well, can you also see from this picture that if we put the torsion in, then it gets to say again. Like if the group, if the purple thing is is torsion, is torsion. Is it clear from the picture that the pairing should fit zero? No. I mean, I'm, I'll argue that in just a minute, but you have, no, you have to say something. So let's say on HK of X Z, well, that's identified with HK of X mod toward So here we have a pairing HK of X mod torsion tensor H N minus K of X. Again, we can divide by the torsion into Z. And that is
from Hn mod tor Hn minus K mod torsion to Hk mod torsion. This is the inverse of Planck radiality. The Planck radiality, the way I formulated it, goes from here to here. So that's what I mean when I say uh, is another way to view the well. Another way to view Planck duality. So let's just think for a moment why this is um, invariant under. Suppose I were to add a co-boundary to C. Try to see I get the same answer. So I'd have some. Well, let's take take a slightly different. Suppose that C was the boundary of something. So suppose that C n minus k is the boundary of some mu n minus k plus one. I would do exactly the same. Uh, use exactly the same techniques to study the intersection of zeta with mu. So zeta intersect mu. Now you have three pod, three things to think about. We have the k simplices in zeta intersected the n minus k plus one simplices in mu. Well, these will give me one. This will give one manifold. So some of these two dimensions is one more. So if these meet transversally, they'll meet in a one manifold. And now where is the boundary of that one manifold? Well, it has two types of boundary. It has boundary delta k minus one intersect delta n minus k plus one. And those boundaries cancel out in pairs because these faces, these co-dimension one faces in this cycle come in pairs with opposite sides. So anytime you see a one manifold hitting it with this kind of boundary, you'll have another, you'll have a continuation of that one manifold um, on the other, on the next k simplex of zeta. And exactly the same argument applies on the other side. When you get a co-dimension one face here, the fact that they come in pairs tells you that the other kind of one manifold uh, edge is also a pair up. So you get a one manifold. which are paired up, those are the ones in the interior, and across those your one manifold continues. But then it also has boundary mu faces where your one manifold will go off and just hit. Because this is a this is a boundary of mu, there's no no second simplex on the other side. So what you get here is a one manifold, a compact one manifold which is a union of circles and intervals. And the boundary of that one manifold is the intersection of zeta with xi. But the boundary of one manifold is zero. It has as many pluses as minuses. Everything is oriented. So that proves that if you vary this by a, if this is a boundary, then you get zero for the intersection number. Now, if this were a torsion class, n times it would be a boundary, and therefore this intersection number with n times it would be zero, but the intersection number is bilinear, so the original intersection is zero. Okay. Now, the similar argument for the torsion classes goes like this. It's a linking. So now you have two cycles which are, which are disjoint. They're linking dimension cycles. 
So for example, in a three manifold, the torsion could be in H1. And you would get torsion in H1, torsion in H1. Well, the fact that this is a torsion class says that there's some chain that has K sheets here coming in and meeting this thing. So there are K sheets coming in along this cycle. That's the statement that K times it is a boundary. These sheets all have the same orientation as they come in. That's why I've drawn them this way. Well, that's something of one dimension higher, so it will meet this other cycle in a finite set of points. And that's the evaluation I was talking about before, and then you will divide by the number of sheets you have here. And that's classically called the linking pairing. All right. So those, that's a geometric way to think about these pairings. Intersections of various cycles, or we call these the mod end cycles in the manifold. But now we're going to go back to the global structure of the homology. And let's think first about these, um, the lattice pairings. So we have, let me do it in, in the last language, really in terms of homology. We have a pairing like this. Into the integers. The intersection pair. Which is some version, as I said over there, of point where duality on the homology or cohomology my torsion. Okay. Well, it has a sign. This is a signed pairing. Alpha intersected beta is minus one to the degree of alpha, degree of beta, beta intersect alpha. That's clear from this geometric description because if you reverse what's first and second here, you'll flip by a minus one to the k times a minus k in your orientation. It's also clear from this formula that uh, alpha on beta cap fundamental class is alpha cup beta on the fundamental class, which is minus 1 to the k, n minus k, and those are the degrees, um, beta cup alpha on the fundamental class, which is minus 1 to the k times n minus k, beta on alpha cap n. So that's reversing the roles of that. So this pairing has a sign. Now, saying you have, there's not really anything interesting to say you have two dual lattices. But when the lattice is self-dual, there's some interesting structure there. But the most interesting case is when n minus k, i.e. n equals 2k. So if we happen to have an even dimensional manifold, then it has a middle homology group, hk, and the free part of that is paired with itself. So then we have hk by torsion, that's all some lattice, enter with itself into the integers, the minus 1 to the k symmetric pairing. And it's perfect. Meaning, if you choose a basis for this lattice, and you write this pairing as a matrix, the determinant of the matrix is plus or minus 1. That is, the adjoint of this pairing is an isomorphism from the group to its dual group. 
So those pairings are interesting, these self-dual pairings. It turns out in this, in the case when k is odd, so when n is 4k plus 2, 4l plus 2, then k is 2l plus 1, and k is odd, the pairing is skewed. And up to equivalence, there's only the rank. The only invariant is the rank of, in other words, the rank of the group, which has to be even. And in an appropriate basis, the pairing looks like a direct sum of these things. So what is perfect? What is what? Perfect? Um, yeah. yeah. Non-degenerate. Non-degenerate. Uh, well, not, non-degenerate sometimes means something else. It means if you take the adjoint, you get a map from this group to the dual of this group. That map is an isomorphism. So if you choose a basis, this pairing will be represented by a either symmetric or skew symmetric matrix. That matrix has determined plus minus one. But here the rank is not full. Here the, sorry? Here the rank is not full. We have a skew. We have well, a skew symmetric metric with odd dimension. No, there's, so that's why, that's why the rank has to be even. There is no non degenerate skew symmetric pairing yeah. on a lattice of odd rank. Oh, sorry. It's k equals to two out of plus one. That's a dimension of the lattice. Right. So every pairing, there is a basis for this lattice, so that in the, that basis, the matrix is just block. There's two by two blocks down the diagonal. That's a nice and fairly easy exercise. The other case is more interesting. So when n equals four l k equals 2L, now we have a symmetric pair. This is symmetric. And these are very interesting. Symmetric unimodular, what you usually say here. But it's perfect. Perfect or unimodular. In other words, choose a basis. This thing becomes a symmetric matrix, and the determinant of that matrix is plus or minus one. And what's the equivalence? So A is a symmetric matrix. Uh, determinant plus or minus one. That's what we're talking about. And the equivalence is you can vary A by B A B transpose or any uh, unimodular matrix B. So this is quadratic <coughs> forms we're talking about, integral quadratic forms, or integral symmetric bilinear pairings. And this is the equivalence relation. So you have this nice matrix, symmetric matrix, and you allow these operations on it. And you want to classify them. Well, classification is not so simple. There's lots of them. There are only finitely many up to equivalence in any given rank. But one of the most interesting is the pairing that goes with the Thinking diagram of the group E8. So this is in, it's rank A, even, even, unimodular. You know, yeah. Even means the diagonal entries are even. And the diagonal entries of this matrix are even if and only if x dot x is even for all x in the lattice.
So if you have a basis E1 up to Ek, Er is the basis, and if Ei dot Ei is congruent to 0 mod 2, then if I look at any sum uh, Ti, Ei, integral linear combination of the basis, dotted with itself, I get sum Ti squared times 2, well, times Ei, Ei, plus twice summation i less than j, ti, tj, ei, ej, which is automatically even. So if all of these guys are even, this whole expression is even. So this matrix has even entries down the diagonal if and only if the pairing is even, completely even, since of x dot x is always even. For any vector x. And this, this is the first even unimodular pairing, smallest even unimodular pairing. I said it went with the Dinkin diagram. So you take the entries down the diagonal are all minus two. And any time, so the dots here are our basis. Down the diagonal, you have minus two. And then the off diagonal entries are either going to be zeros or ones. An ij entry is a one exactly if the i dot and the j dot are connected by a bond in this diagram. Otherwise, they're zero. That turns out to be a unimodular matrix. <coughs> determine a one. And that's the smallest even model in the matrix. Alright, well, this, this is just an example, or this is actually, we have more to say. Yeah, I, was, I have more to say, but I'll do that next week. I have a lot more to say. Um, I'm just getting started. I think. Yeah, this is not supposed to indicate that this is the complete classification. Classification is very complicated. There's a beautiful lattice in degree 24 called the Leach lattice. This is the first lattice where all the diagonal entries are four. The minimum x squared is, is the leach lattice. The minimum x squared is four. x i x is four. And if you go up, you find the minimum x dot x becomes arbitrarily large for your pairing. What's the signature? 20 to 24. So leech lattice, these are positive definite. Yeah, I mean this question about the, the smallest value only makes sense for positive definite and negative definite. Yeah, this is positive definite. Well, I guess the way I set it up is negative definite. All right. So I'll talk a little bit more about this next time, and then maybe I'll talk about um, classification of three manifolds. And if there's interest, when I get back in March, I can talk about the rationalization.